Good afternoon, everyone. This is Troy. Thanks for joining in. We have uh, just a minute before we get started, so please sit tight and we'll be getting things started soon. Hello, everyone. I hope you all had a very restful holiday and a happy new year. This is our first of many webinars we'll be hosting in 2018. So let's get started. I'm Troy Miller, FCAM's Associate Director for Research and Policy, and it's great to be joining you for today's webinar on good jobs in Florida. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, first, we want to hear from you. Submit your questions in the chat box you see to the right or in the corner that should be visible um, on your screen. You'll also see some handouts in the little GoToWebinar application. One would be national report released um, earlier or uh, later in the fall, and then um, the other Florida-specific state report is also included there in the handouts. Um, we'll also be keeping up with our Twitter feed during the webinar. So you can ask questions or let us know what you think FL College Access. If this is your first FCAN webinar, welcome. We are a statewide organization based in Tampa, Florida that works with communities and education stakeholders across the state who share a common interest in moving the needle on college and career readiness, access, and completion. It's our belief that this work is too important to do alone, which is why we partner with not just K-12 and post-secondary institutions, but also nonprofits, foundations, government, and business leaders to help meet our goal to ensure that at least 60% of working-age Floridians hold a high-quality post-secondary degree or credential by the year 2025. We're going to be talking about these degrees and credentials often during today's webinar, but just so we're clear, FCAN has a broad definition of what we mean by a high-quality degree or credential which includes associates and bachelor's degrees, certificates, certifications, apprenticeships, and other awards or programs that can help students get a good job with opportunities to further build their education, training, and skills. We have a multi-layered approach to achieving our goal, which combines research, news and information, statewide initiatives, and local college access networks, which you can see by the slide here, represents over 78% of the state's population. LCANs are community-based, cross-sector coordinating bodies supported by a team of community and education leaders representing public and private sectors, which often use a collective impact or similar approach to make decisions, set goals, and align the resources and strategies needed to meet the goals, to meet the goals and needs of their local students. If your community or county isn't filled in on the map, but you'd like to learn how, please reach out to our assistant director for network partnerships, Kathy McDonald, whose information as listed below. Another strand of our work helps to build public knowledge of key trends and issues through policy briefs, data dashboards, and reports that illuminate barriers to post-secondary attainment, along with policies and practices with promise to overcome them. With the legislative session starting this week, we released a preview of the proposals that stand to impact Florida college students. We also publish interactive dashboards and support our partners across the state with the data and research needed to improve outcomes for their students. You can find our new legislative preview and our other research and data resources on our new website. On the new uh, website, which we're proud to announce, um, you'll find all of our uh, resources and data and research. Uh, this week marked the soft launch of the site, so we're still taking off the bubble wrap, so to speak. 
But please check it out and let us know what you think. The new layout features our new branding and displays our content in ways that we hope are easier to find and share. On the new website, you can also find information on our statewide initiatives this year across the three initiatives Schools from more than half of Florida counties are taking part in a College Ready Florida program, which is our highest ever. The Florida FAFSA Challenge, which provides schools and districts with opportunities to receive recognition and awards for high school senior FAFSA completion rates, is ongoing. And stay tuned for an announcement on this year's Florida College Decision Day activities in the coming weeks. You can now register for one or all of the initiatives using the same form, which you can find on our new website under Initiatives. If you have any questions, please contact Amy Bullock, our statewide programs coordinator. The reason these and our other efforts are so important is that we have work to do to help Floridians get the education and training they need to get good jobs. As you can see here, approximately 47% of working age adults have a post-secondary certificate or higher, which despite recent gains, put us behind where labor economists predict we'll need to be to meet future workforce demands. Data from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity shows it's hard to get a good job with a high school diploma alone. Average annual wages are shown here by education and training level, which you can see here are highly correlated. And while it's true that a college costs a lot for some students and families, we know how much it costs them not to go. According to state data, only about 50% of high school grads who don't go to college, don't go to a college, university, or technical center are found employed after graduating while making minimal earnings. If you're interested in seeing the breakdown for earnings and education in your region, we have an interactive dash dashboard, which you can find on the research and data page on our new website. This trend connecting more education to good jobs is one that is predicted to continue into the future. Again, looking at Florida data, the top 10 fastest growing jobs all require some form of post-secondary education beyond high school. If you take a closer look, you'll notice that not all of these jobs with high growth requires a bachelor's degree or some kind of advanced degree. Some require a post-secondary vocational certificate or associate's degree, which brings us to today's webinar topic. Our speaker today is Neil Ridley, director of the state initiative at the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. He leads the center's effort to help states integrate education and workforce data systems for policy, program, planning and development, evaluation and improve feedback between labor markets and education. If you're not familiar with the center's work, their research aims to inform and educate federal, state and local policymakers and stakeholders, including FCAN, on ways to better align education and training with labor market demands and qualifications. Neil, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Give me just a moment to uh, switch the slides over to you. All right, perfect, Neil. Good afternoon, thanks, Troy. And as you may know, the, uh, the, the our center is an independent research and policy center based at Georgetown University here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Most of our research has been, uh, that you might be familiar with, has been on job projections, uh, looking at the demand for educated workers in the future, uh, college majors and what and what graduates are earning when they you know, after they leave school and go into into the labor market. Our latest research, which I'm going to be talking about today, focuses on jobs available for for workers for those who don't have a bachelor's degree or or more than a bachelor's degree. And this is an often overlooked part of the education spectrum and the and the job spectrum as well, or the labor market. And uh, I think one of the one of the reasons we have we've put out a series of reports is to shine more of a light on the job and what is and what is happening in what's often an overlooked part of the spectrum. And as you may, as many of you know, not everyone go follows the high school to four-year college pathway, at least not right after high school. 
they may um, go into the workforce, spend some years before they actually go back to get a bachelor's degree or or more. And so I'm going to be talking about this research that looks at uh, that, that looks at what's the good jobs and what's what's in the labor market for those that don't that actually don't have a bachelor's degree or at least not yet. So, so first, with some to provide some context, in the past, credential attainment was almost synonymous with degree attainment. That's uh, that's the way we, uh, the way the Census Bureau and and the way most people thought of tracking credentials was uh, by looking at actual degrees awarded by colleges. Do you have one or do you not? And that's really the way a lot of our data. Uh, was produced that was collected and produced in the past. Well, we're now starting to, and with Census Bureau very much uh, in the lead on this, we're starting to look at uh, credential attainment differently and somewhat more broadly. There's there's now a whole universe of credentials, including degrees, but also including some non-degree credentials. And that's what this chart is supposed to show. Is on, on the first line you see, or the top line you see traditional degrees and certificates, which in many cases look look and sound like degrees in that they are awarded for completion of a program of study or for the requirements within a program of study. And then but on the other line, you see these other types of non-degree credentials that are generally awarded outside of the education system, outside of a community college or, or university or, or, or provider. And so the first one is certifications, uh, and that sometimes gets confused with certificates, but it's really a very different class of group of credentials. Certifications are usually uh, based on an industry or, a, or an occupation, and they're usually awarded based on a test, an exam, or a demonstration of proficiency. So, uh, and then the other point is that they are, they're often awarded by, they tend to be awarded by industry associations, professional associations, third party groups that are, general, that are outside, of, outside of the educational institution. So some examples are the CompTIA entry level uh, certification for, for IT workers. There are, there are welding certifications issued by national, uh, national association. And actually there's a whole, there's a plethora, a whole slew of certifications. And then licenses are somewhat similar to certifications, except that they're awarded by the government. They're usually, government, usually, uh, usually at the state level, but um, they're, they're awarded by government for, and it's essentially a permit to work in a certain occupation. And there are often requirements involved, including education and training requirements and, and, other, and, other, um, and other requirements. So that's kind of the world of credentials that we're that we're facing right now, and then a word on uh, where where we are with attainment and uh, and projections in Florida. Uh, a lot of our work in the past that you might be familiar with focuses on projections of demand for educated workers, and as Troy mentioned, uh, Florida, according to the Stronger Nation data, is right around 47% attainment. If you include degrees, and then if you include certificate attainment, which is uh, another, which is part of what, what was on the previous slide, get to about 47%, I think is what Troy showed. Now, at the Georgetown Center, we've, we developed projections that look on the demand side, not so much on the supply side, that is what people are earning, or, but on the demand side, that is what's, what is the economy demanding in terms of the level of education and training. And right, we we're projecting for Florida that um, that that it's going to be right around the national average. Actually, right on the national average, 65% of job openings are going are going to require some level of post-secondary education. So that that can include a whole that can include certificates, but it can include uh, a range of post-secondary education beyond obviously beyond high school. So with that little background, we're going to jump into our good jobs research. So some of you may have seen the, the report that came out in July, uh, 
good jobs that pay uh, without a BA. And one of our main findings at the national level is that there are about 30 million workers, there are about 30 million workers with good jobs that, that uh, and for workers that don't actually have a bachelor's degree or, or more. That's about a quarter of the workforce, so not an insignificant slice of the workforce that, that have those, uh, those good jobs. And Florida, along with California and Texas, rise to the top, rise to the, so the, they're in the top three states with the largest number of good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree. And that's uh, partly because of the growth in those states population growth, but because of the, just the size of the economies and the, uh, the employment growth that's taking place in, 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 in those three states. So I'm sure you're wondering, uh, what, what is a good job? You know, how are we defining this? And the first point is that it's based on individual wages, individual earnings. We're not looking at household income or family, family income. Um, in the way that that, um, that other studies or other other measures might look at, and so we set uh, two levels of for the for the wage threshold. The first level is thirty five thousand dollars per year, and that's for younger workers. Um, that's roughly this roughly equivalent to seventeen dollars per hour, and then we set a somewhat higher standard for older workers, uh, forty five thousand dollars for those over age forty five. Now, when you look at the, the universe of good jobs for those that, that don't have a bachelor's degree, you see that the median is actually right around $55,000. That's 55, so the median earnings, annual earnings, right around $55,000, and, and, and quite a few people, quite a few workers with wages uh, above that level. Now, one of the main findings in our in our national report was that good jobs. Uh, when when we looked at good jobs and what what's happened to them over time, we found that good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree went down. They declined uh, in in blue collar industries, what we're calling blue collar industries, and it was really driven by the loss of good jobs in manufacturing. Uh, as, as you may know, manufacturing and actually some other blue collar uh, occupations, uh, I mean, industries, uh, construction, for example, tend uh, traditionally rely on, have relied on high school educated workers. And manufacturing in particular is, uh, is one where there, there were pretty sharp job losses since the 1990s and actually going back before that. But, but the time period we looked at was 1991 up until the current period. Now the other side of that is that we saw a lot of growth in good jobs for those with less than a, with, with less than a bachelor's degree in skilled services industries and that's what we call a group of industries with health services as the prime example. Health services, financial, real estate, uh, and information services. Now, it's important to note that that's the national pattern, but we found that Florida, along with uh, actually a host of other states, more than 20 other states, actually broke with this national model. And, uh, and, and so Florida actually experienced growth in good jobs in both blue collar industries and skilled services industries since the, since the 1990s. And on the blue collar side, you can see the blue bar there. That is mostly the result of expansion in blue collar industries that, that are not manufacturing. So that's really reliant on growth in construction and, and transportation, logistics, those areas, more than, uh, much more than manufacturing. The other major theme in our report, in both of our reports, uh, is that education matters for, for, for good jobs that, uh, that pay without a bachelor's degree, without a BA. Most of the growth has gone to workers with an associate's degree in particular, that's where we saw the most explosive growth, as well as some college, no degree. As you can see, good jobs actually went down overall for those with, with a high school education or less. And what's interesting is that this this movement, this tilt toward those with associate's degrees, 
is also true was also true for manufacturing, even as there wasn't kind of an overall even though even even though good jobs were being shed in manufacturing, we did see a shift within the good jobs that were that continued to be uh, offered in manufacturing toward those with associate's degree. So it so it paid to have a have a uh, associate's degree in manufacturing during these changes. Now, in Florida too, Florida followed the national trend. Really, this was a common thread in every state. We saw that that education this this education trend was very strong. And this chart pulls out the data for Florida, and it shows the distribution of good jobs. Um, it shows the, the, the share of good jobs by education level. So, so what um, at every level, uh, what percentage of jobs for workers in that in that education level actually have a good job? And what you see in, instantly is the staircase pattern, right? That's quite familiar, and it's similar to the, the wage pattern that. Uh, that Troy showed in his initial slides. It's really the mirror image of the of median wages by education level, lifetime earnings by by education level, employment by education level. And so it's it's a very familiar pattern. And what it clearly shows is workers with with bachelor's degrees and and, and above, obviously, as well as those with associate's degrees, are much more likely uh, they're much more likely to have good jobs. Now, what's our data uh, was 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 reliant on what uh, what we what is currently collected, and so we we could not get into. So it's mostly reliant on education level and and degree level, and so it's important to point out that as I mentioned before, that the credential universe has really been changing. It's much more complex and much more confusing than than it used to be. There are degrees, and then there are traditional degrees, certificates, and then there are a lot of non-degree credentials. And this is important because, especially for, for those without a bachelor's degree, we're finding that certifications in an industry for, for, for an occupation, licenses, are, are very, or, or quite, can be quite important uh, in terms of wages and, uh, and uh, in terms of wages, annual earnings. So the first point is that that the first point is that certifications and licenses are often bundled with degrees. There, that that uh, that workers will often have have a degree and and a license, you know, and a license in, in a healthcare field, for example, or or uh, accounting or whatever it might be. Uh, and so so that it's important to see that there it's not necessarily exclusive. That it's it's often complementary. And the second point, which I think is especially important for for workers without a bachelor's degree, um, without a bachelor's degree or beyond, that some of the some of the certifications and and licenses and certainly some certificates as well have a lot of labor market value on their own, and so so this is this can be particularly important for uh, for for workers without um, without degrees. Because it can actually add, it can give you, can give a wage boost in, in some cases, and it's important to say that that the some college no degree category that we've that you've seen on some of the previous slides is really one of the gray areas in um, one of the more nebulous, you know, less well articulated areas in the education space on the education spectrum. It's it's really it pulls together people in very different situations. Some who have taken a few courses and 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 dropped out or left uh, left college. Some who have just who have taken some courses just just because they want to take a few courses and and then it includes those that might actually have a certificate, for example, but not but haven't actually completed their associate's degree. So it's really a it's a, uh, it's, a it's a large group of people in very different situations, uh, different education situations. So now we're going to plunge back into the good jobs data for Florida, and this this shows that um, that Florida is actually one of the states that where there was growth in good job. So so there so there was modest growth nationally, but of course not all not all states sh showed growth. And Florida is actually one of the states, and and most of the states that did have growth were in the south 
and the West, as you can tell from this, this map. Uh, Florida, in Florida, good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree actually grew about um, almost 50, almost 50 percent, just just fell short of the, the top category there by a couple percentage points. But other states, especially those in the Northeast and the Midwest, were, were not quite as fortunate. The, the overall U.S. average was 10 percent growth, roughly 10 percent growth. Now, uh, in Florida, the, uh, this is the earnings distribution for the good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree in Florida. What you see is that the median is quite close to the, to the national median. It's 54 compared to 55,000 for the, for the national median. And again, you have uh, on our pie chart circle there, you can see a fair number, are, a fair number quite a few, uh, there's a good chunk of workers earning uh, well north of 55,000. That, that are that have these jobs that they have these good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree. And then when we look at the industry breakdown in Florida, will you see something that's somewhat different actually than a number of other states that I've looked at? A clear majority of the good jobs are in skilled services industries. And again, health services is a prime example of of this. Of, of the of the skilled services industries, so Florida, California, a few other states have uh, have been at the lead of this of this trend, the shift toward good jobs showing up in skilled services industries, and, and Florida certainly is certainly one of them. But again, this is somewhat different. This breaks the with the pattern in a number of other states. Now, turning to industries. Uh, Specific industries within within the, the the broader categories that I mentioned. Uh, what you see in Florida is that um, that again, skilled services industries dominate uh, in terms of where where you can find the good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree. The top the top one, the one with the largest number of good jobs, is information, financial activities, and real estate. Information includes a whole range of industries, including telecommunications, cable, cable companies, internet providers, and uh, media outlets, and, and a whole range of a uh, whole range of those kinds of companies. And then health services, of course, is is number two. And uh, and then you can see also some blue collar industries that make it into the top five: construction, uh, with with a healthy number and transportation as well, and again, construction is one of the industries that that it, that has traditionally and and still to some extent uh, offers uh, a number of jobs for those with a with a high school education. And then turning to the occupation side, uh, you'll see that in this case that. This, is, this pattern is quite similar to what we're seeing nationally and ma many other states. Management uh, occupations uh, have, tend to have, actually have the largest number, but then also the highest share of good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree. And this is all a range of management positions from frontline supervisor um, to, to kind of mid-level as well. And, and, even, and in, even in some cases, executives who, who may not have may not have completed a bachelor's degree but started their own company and 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 obviously became you know were the founder they were the founder and the executive and then number two we have a lot of nurses in the in the category for healthcare practitioners as well as um, health technicians diagnostic technicians and and others and then uh, HVAC um, HVAC mechanics and and others in the third category uh, electronics installers and uh, repair people, and and so on. So that gives you a flavor for uh, for the for the occupation groups where you're most likely to find good jobs. And we've shown the the share of the workers in each occupation that have that have good jobs. So that's. A quick, um, a relatively quick survey of, kind of the world of good jobs for those without a bachelor's degree uh, nationally and and in in Florida. And 
we think that this is important. We think this research is is useful and important because, as I said, it does it starts to shine a light on a part of the education space and the job space that we don't always pay attention to, or that's not always in the popular um, popular attention span. And 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 understanding where the good jobs are by industry and occupation can help people in lots of different situations. So it, it can be useful at the state level to economic developers, business groups that are that are that are looking to expand or looking to looking to to see where um, where industries are growing. It can be useful to work workforce practitioners as well and at the local level or the state level to see where uh, where the best opportunities might be. And obviously it can be useful to educators uh, in community colleges, uh, public schools, um, private schools, universities as well um, to see what um, what what types of job what types of jobs well for those at, at different education levels and some of this some of this can be infused into uh, into advising into counseling or, or it can be paired with other tools that the that schools may have to to provide information and then the other point is that education as I said education matters I think our good jobs research just reinforces the point that that the more education you have, the more likely you are to, to have a good job, and the more likely you are to be on a on a on a pathway to the middle class. Um, and uh, and and so and then and then good jobs don't necessarily. Um, there are good jobs that go to those without a bachelor's degree. That's the other point. Although the as we as we said, the trend for those without a bachelor's degree is that the associate's degree. Is paying off even in industries that that may not where that might not have been the case in the past. And then the third point is is more about is more for uh, for you to think about and for for this for the people at the state level to think about how can we how can we build a better transition and improve the transitions between between high school and college between college. Uh, different types of colleges, community two-year and four-year, and create kind of a better connection between education and the work, the workplace. And this points in the direction of part, better partnerships between community colleges and high schools, between community colleges and and employers as well in different regions. And there's also there's also a role for workforce agencies at the local level as well that are that are actively trying to and to find jobs for and and place uh, place people that are coming out of coming out of programs. Now I did I want to point out that uh, we have put together a a website with uh, goodjobsdata.org, and that will have all of the reports that and we're continuing to produce reports. We will probably put out a, a couple more reports this year. And it also includes very detailed data at the state level, nationally. Um, a lot of the data that I've that I've presented here that you can break down 15 different ways if you're if you're so inclined. And uh, and then, as I said, that uh, there's a there's a profile within the state report that uh, that Troy has as a handout. There are there's a state profile, two page profile for every state, including a colorful one there for for Florida. And with that, I will turn it back to Troy. Thanks, Neil. Unless we have someone else who wants to uh, chime in on the on the webinar again, um, <laughs> it, it sounds like uh, it sounds like we're we're good now. Though um, we had a, a couple of great questions, a couple data related. Um, I am going to take a, a quick second to. There we go. Um, Neil's contact information is here. Um, if there are any specific follow-up questions regarding the, the report or data, we're going to go over some of them now. Um, Neil, there is a question um, about counting certifications, um, de determining which ones count. That was one question. And then there was someone else who asked if there's been any discussion at the federal level to include licensure 
and or industry recognized certifications um, in addition to the degrees um, included in the future census reporting. Um, this is a question we get asked often nearly at, a, at nearly every presentation you know that we give. Um, obviously there's a benefit to the census data that it transcends the outcomes of any one institution. It gives us a snapshot of the residents, but we have that gray area you referred to earlier with folks that have some college that doesn't fully reflect all the different credentials that our post-secondary institutions award. Yes. So on the first question, was that related to certifications or certificates or, or both? Um, so the first question was how we determine which certifications to count. And I actually I asked a follow up um, to that question just to, to specify, and I didn't hear anything back. So let's go to the second part of that question about the census right. reporting of, um, you know, it's this question of highest level of education attained. Yes, so there have been a lot of developments uh, in this area, as I mentioned in the past, for most of the past. Uh, it was degree attainment that was the the focus of data collection and reporting at the at the national level, and um, so it's been it's really only recently, only actually in the last ten years or so that uh, that the experts at the Census Bureau have gotten together with experts outside of outside of government to think about how to how to improve our collection of of data in this area, and. And there actually is a lot. Um, there's a lot to to show for that. There's there's a, I guess you could call it a project, but it's it's really a, a cluster of initiatives called Gemina, uh, and it's uh, it's run by it's run by the Census Bureau. Basically, the the goal of Gemina is to infuse uh, collection data collection for certificates um, and certifications. Uh, into certifications licenses into as many different national surveys, household surveys as as they can, and and actually already there are there are some national estimates. They're uh, they're not there. We're getting to the point where we can. Uh, there's been a couple of years of results at the national level for uh, for certifications and licenses, and. Uh, we're, we're at, we think that as 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 you get more year, as you get a larger sample, more years, it will be possible to come up with some state numbers for uh, for how many you know how many Florida residents, how many Florida workers hold certifications. So that data is definitely coming along. There's as I said, there's two two years of uh, of data from a, suppl a supplement to the C supplementary questions to the CPS that. That you can start to look at, and and it's helpful in showing you know what industry, what area, what industries, what areas are more likely to have certifications. What's what are the wages associated with those at every education level? So yeah, it's we're definitely we're starting to break down some of those those walls between uh, between what we know about degree attainment and and um, attainment of non-degree credentials. But just going back to the first part, I think what they were trying to get at was that. That perhaps not every you know not every certification is uh, is valuable or or useful, and I guess that is um, that's also an area of research that uh, that the that the National Association of Manufacturers is is taking on. They've they have an initiative um, certification data initiative in which they're they're trying to they're trying to pair for, with selected states. They're trying to pair. Data on certification holders uh, that are that are that are completing them in certain states uh, with clearing house, national student clearinghouse data that shows what their pathways were, uh, what what their attainment was, what their enrollment patterns were to some extent, and then they're trying to which they haven't done yet, but they're trying to to come up with a wage match at the national level to see what the wages are for different certifications. And I think I think what that question was getting at is we need to know more, which, which we entirely agree with at Georgetown, which is that we we need to know more about what what the labor market payoff is for individual certifications, and just say that 
can't just obviously just assume that any certification is um, is valuable, but and they might be valuable in different ways. Some might give a, a leg up to somebody who's just starting in a field, and others might be really valuable to someone who's might be a wage boost to somebody who's already working in that in that field. And we just need to know a lot more. And 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 so so I think that was the probably the direction of that direction of that question. Yeah, there's um I th I think there's a lot of agreement, Neil, around um and, and understanding around the fact that you know the higher um, by far on average the higher education and training one gets, the more likely they are to earn more. But there are all these other credentials and awards that are valuable in certain regards, and because they're not measured by the certain that by the census currently, sometimes they uh, can go overlooked, um, which uh, kind of I serves as a segue into our next question. I looked this up yesterday, um, and uh, in Florida, 71% of our adult residents don't have a bachelor's degree. And when I looked up um, some uh, some information uh, from the National Center on Education Statistics, uh, NCS, it said that over 95% of educators have a bachelor's degree. So kind of goes back to what you've been saying multiple times that we have, you know, some of these pathways that are overlooked. Um, you know, I have a bachelor's degree, you do. Uh, Neil, I, I know that, um, you know, I, I work in this field because I love higher ed, um, but I didn't, you know, take those pathways myself. And I'm, I'm wondering with, you know, the fact that the, the vast majority of folks that work with students you know, because they have bachelor's degrees or higher, how, how is it that we can um, help our educators and counselors get a better understanding of kind of the full breadth of pathways to good jobs that are available? Well, I think I think that this uh, this data is a start. I think, and there are um, we're going to be putting out additional reports. On how how this plays out by uh, race ethnicity and how it plays out for certain industries as well so I think that taking a look at this at this data uh, by nationally and then by by state is is a good is a good way to go I think um, I think I think that's I think it's right that that people may not people probably overlook some of the some of these pathways I do think that um, it's going to be especially it's going to be especially important for uh, for advisors, counselors, career services at the at the two year level as to to to, to become familiar with with some of this data and some of some of the advice that goes along with it as well. And so I think that so I think it can I can I think it can probably play a different role in different different. Um, Different places, uh, including, I think, early on, I think it's it's helpful for it's helpful for students to know what the you know what a range of options are, what a range of possibilities are, even if they are thinking about going directly to a four-year college or university right after right after high school. Um, that it's it's still helpful to 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 have have a feel for what some of these uh, what what some of the credentials are, and also what some of the, the job possibilities are, and then, and also we're seeing a trend of, of as I as I mentioned, especially for some of the non-degree credentials, we're seeing a fair number of workers with bachelor's degrees who who who, who actually earn earn uh, certainly they'll earn a license so that they can do their you know, perform their profession, but they may get certifications to as they as they broaden their skills or deepen their skills, they will often add specialty certifications, and you know, as as part of career development. So, so in some ways, it's I think it behooves everyone to to start to understand what the world of credentials is and what what the what the different pathways are. And I think we have time for one more quick question, Neil. There was a question um, you made reference to some of the data that. Um, I know that I think I saw it in the report you mentioned might be more might be coming later, but it's for regarding um, racial ethnicity and gender gaps even for 
um, for workers who maybe have uh, some college or have a degree, um, but they're underrepresented in the good jobs group. Um, so I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit um, and tell us maybe what some of the feedback has been on that finding. And that's on the, sorry again, did you say which finding that was again? Uh, the fact that uh, among workers who had the good jobs, um, they were disproportionately going to, I think I'd said men and white workers. And I know that you may mention that there's some data that might be uh, coming, more data that might be coming out um, in the near future on that. Um, yes, yeah, we're gonna be, we're looking right now at some of the differences by race, ethnicity, and I think what we, uh, what you're referring to is that we found that um, in our in our July report that uh, that that white workers have have the largest share. They hold the largest share of good jobs. So that share has has gone down somewhat since the 1990s. Hispanic uh, Hispanic workers uh, have gained share, have increased the share that they of good jobs that they hold, and and actually the share held by uh, by black workers has been has really not changed that much and we're um, we do want to we want to look more closely at uh, what's going on underneath some of these some of these trends uh, but I mean clearly some of the, the gr certainly the growth in uh, Latino good job holding is a function of you know, the rapid recent growth in in employment and in population in the Latino population, not just in Florida, but in, in a number of states, there are about 10 states across the country where uh, Latino, uh, where Latino workers, Latino residents have, uh, where they're a much larger presence than they were 10 or even 20 years ago. And so, so in some ways, some of that, some of the good job holding reflects some of those demographic trends, but we still want to look at, we still want to look more closely at job hold, you know, who's holding what kinds of jobs and what, what areas, what fields to see what's really going on. Yeah, and for those of you who aren't aware, um, the Georgetown Center has done some great reporting on um, the different opportunity gaps that exist out there in higher ed, and so I encourage you to take a look at some of their previous reporting if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, I want to uh, thank Neil uh, and thank everyone who submitted questions. We didn't get to some, but I promise that uh, I'm going to loop Neil in and help get his um, direct response to you on a couple of inquiries and questions that we received. Um, I have a, uh, the next slide I have is just a look of, list of quick resources um, that pertain to uh, this topic to help us continue thinking about ways that we can help more students get the education and training they need to get a good job. I also wanted to make a very quick announcement about our upcoming FCAN Summit, which takes place May 10th and 11th in Orlando at the Hyatt Regency. Um, registration will be opening soon in just a, uh, about two weeks, I believe. Um, we'll, we will be uh, featuring, this year we have over 50 speakers and experts discussing topics like college access and affordability, uh, workforce development, college success, and uh, local college access networks. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and uh, a, a really special thank you for being patient with the, the audio issues that we have. That was uh, bizarre there for a little bit. Um, keep an e email uh, and an eye out for an email on the way from us soon that will have the slides, um, the recording, the resources, the reports. Um, and also, please stay tuned uh, for an invite to register for our next webinar on an innovative program at the University of South Florida that helps students communicate how their education translates to the skills employers seek. That one will be hosted by Kathy McDonald, our Assistant Director for Network Development. I want to thank Neil Ridley again from the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. Have a great day, everyone.